Greetings, my fellow Starship Captains, and welcome to yet another new series of Warhammer 40k lore. At the suggestion of one of my subscribers, I came to realize there was another important Imperial organization that I have been neglecting for a while now. And here I am talking about the Imperial Navy. So today we are gonna get started on them with the usual episode where I talk a bit about their history and some general facts. This will of course be followed by videos on their organization, ranks of their personnel, and then videos on the ships themselves, from frigates to battleships. I am your host, the Grim Dark Narrator, and without further ado, let us learn a few things about Imperial Navy history, shall we? The Imperial Navy is obviously one of the largest military elements of the Imperium of Man. While the Imperial Guard represents the Imperium's ground forces, the Imperial Navy is responsible for the fleets of warships that maintain order between the stars and planets populated by humanity. They are also responsible for providing air support in a war zone and for transporting Imperial Guard regiments across the galaxy to the Imperium's thousands of war zones. And like I said, in this episode we will cover a good bit of their history. During the Great Crusade to reunite all the scattered colony worlds of mankind beneath the rule of the Imperium, both the Imperial Guard and the Imperial Navy were originally a single service, the Imperialis Auxilia, or Imperial Army. Collectively, these massive war fleets would come to be referred to as the Armada Imperialis. Under this form of organization, each Imperial cruiser would have a single Imperial Army regiment assigned to it. Imperial Army regimental commanding officers held command over both their regiment and the warship assigned to them, making a single warship a tactically flexible combined arms unit and minimizing the damage to the Imperium in the event of the loss of a starship. During the Horus Heresy, however, it appeared that some traitor army regiments used the power of the starships at their disposal in order to forge tiny empires for themselves in the fires of anarchy. This tendency to make use of the power of an imperial starship, combined with that of an imperial army regiment to establish tyrannies on many worlds, led to the eventual split of the imperial army into the imperial guard and the imperial navy to purposefully foster a bureaucratic and inter-service rivalry between the two. The Emperor himself issued a decree before his internment within the Golden Throne that starships could no longer be commanded by the officers of the newborn Imperial Guard, but only by the members of their own service. The origins of the Imperial Navy lay in the campaigns of the Great Crusade that began in the second half of the 30th millennium. The Great Crusade was the largest and most ambitious military endeavor ever undertaken by mankind. As mighty and valiant as the hosts of the Emperor were, this epic undertaking would have been entirely impossible without the countless thousands of warp-capable vessels that transported hundreds of thousands of the Adeptus Astartes and millions of Imperial Army soldiers. The Great Crusade saw a staggering amount of vessels constructed reclaimed or pressed into service. Some were used for a matter of months, before being declared obsolete or wearing out and degrading to destruction, quite apart from losses incurred in battle. Others, however, gained a permanent place in the canon of war, with successful designs copied endlessly and modified as the decades advanced. The first vessels to enter the service of the Imperium were constructed in the orbital foundries of Terra, and later Mars's Ring of Iron and the orbital shipyards of Saturn, under the scrutiny of the Emperor himself and the forge rites of the Mechanicum, and indeed it was only in alliance with Mars that the trans-solar expansion was possible in any meaningful way. This was further aided when the Saturnine Dominion, with all its accomplished shipmasters, joined the Imperium after their alien warlords were overthrown. And as the Imperium expanded, many more shipyards were added. Vos, Grolgorod, Lorin, and Cypramundi, 
all growing close to rivaling Mars itself in the production of starships. Born of an Imperium for which the galaxy was now largely conquered, rather than one in which the Emperor still led the Great Crusade, the Imperium formed multiple fleet anchorages. A handful of Imperialis Armada bases situated on or near the Imperium's border. These fleet anchorages, at least one of which was founded in each of the Segmentum Majoris, with more planned, were the largest of their kind outside the Segmentum Solar, and in their turn were dwarfed by the vast capacity of the Sol system itself, and were founded for the specific purpose of securing the domains the Great Crusade had forged in the galaxy. As such, their functions were, in the main, as ports of supply and muster, command and control hubs, and home bases for a permanently stationed armada of warships with their own armies of auxiliar troops. These armadas were designed to serve both as a source of deep-range patrols and rapid reaction forces to respond to sudden threats. These could have been civil disturbances, rebellion, or outside attack, both from within and without the Imperium's borders. In terms of the warships that physically made up these fleets, and the Port Maw Armada was a good example of this, they outnumbered and en masse likely outgunned any single expeditionary fleet of the Great Crusade, at least on paper. They were made up primarily of several hundred first and second rate ships of the line, various classes of cruiser and assault vessels intended to dominate smaller engagements and conduct long patrols, supported by frigates and destroyers meant for escort duty, to pursue and destroy marauders, and hunt Zeno's raiders who might disturb the Emperor's peace. By nature, they possessed fewer large capital class ships than the outward-reaching forces of the Great Crusade by disposition, but those they did possess were often very powerful examples of the type including Goliath and Legatus-class battleships. These two in particular were still extremely strong but support-intensive designs, that had been replaced in frontline service only as the Great Crusade had reached ever further from the core worlds of the Segmentum Solar and supply lines had become stretched. This gave way to the more independently operating Gloriana and Victory patterns, but this was a deficiency of no consequence in their current role. Unlike the ships and armies that made up the great Legionis Astartes expeditionary fleets, the smaller compliance battle groups and the explorator and rogue trader-led formations, they were essentially defensive in nature, inward-looking and meant to be successfully piecemealed down into smaller commands and sub-deployments when needed and for as long as was needed. Because of this, they were made up almost entirely of the Imperialis Auxilia, with cohorts formed in the solar pattern almost exclusively. These were in turn usually drawn from the established Segmentum Exertus commands, and so purely human in makeup and quite outside the regular command structures of the Great Crusade. Their Grand Admirals and Lord Marshals operated under direct authority preferred by the ruling Council of Terra, and were equal or perhaps greater in effective rank than even the Lord's Commander who governed the individual worlds their ships protected. In practice, of course, it would be a very foolish Grand Admiral who would not defer to a Primarch when matters came to it, or an emissary from Terra or Mars. But this growing distance between these two sides of the Imperium's military, one to defend, the other one to conquer, particularly after the Emperor's return to Terra, accounts perhaps for the fact that the traitor's cause did not have as much traction in the midst of these sovereign defense fleets as it did elsewhere in the Imperium's military. This observation bears true in the case of the Port Maw Armada which, despite clear efforts made to deliberately subvert it, remained in the majority loyal. And the crews of those ships and solar auxilia regiments, which did join the traitor's cause, were seldom crewed by wholehearted converts, but more often taken over by a polluted officer cadre, or an armed mutiny by a well-prepared yet ruthless minority. 
During the Great Crusade, it was common practice to subordinate Imperialis Auxiliar regiments to the Imperial Expeditionary Fleets controlled by the Space Marine Legions. But after the corruption by the Chaos Gods of the Emperor's most favored son and Imperial War Master, the Arch Douchebag Horus, it soon became apparent what a monumental mistake it had been to place Imperial Army units under the control of the Space Marines. The War Master led fully half of the legendary Space Marine Legions in open revolt against the Imperium, which had created them and the Master they were sworn to protect. Alongside these legions of genetically enhanced warriors, marched millions of Imperial soldiers, men and women drawn from across the colonies of mankind and gathered under the banner of the Emperor. When Horus turned against his father, he took countless soldiers and ships of the Imperial Army with him. Those men which had fought for humanity during the Emperor's Great Crusade to reunite the human-settled galaxy under the Imperial banner were instead pitted against one another in a bloody struggle as the heresy unfolded and civil war spanned the galaxy. Among the traitor legions, almost all of their attached Imperial Army formations uniformly followed their masters into rebellion, out of fear or blind faith. Even among the Loyalists, Imperial Army units with an officer cadre of genetically enhanced Geno warriors performed poorly, usually driven to destruction by the inability of the unaugmented human soldiers to keep up with the demands of their transhuman space marine leaders. Over the course of the heresy, entire armies of mortals were raised and squandered both by the traitors and the desperate loyalist commanders. After Horus was defeated and his armies had taken flight from Terra into the Eye of Terror, the Imperium was in chaos, weakened and shattered after many years of war. Even though the need for the Imperial Army was as great as ever, those Loyalist leaders that remained, led by the Ultramarine's Primarch Robut Gilliman, were fearful of a repeat of the rebellion which had cost them so dearly. In the aftermath of the Horus Heresy, massive changes were implemented to civil and military administration of the Imperium on Gilliman's orders, a period forever known as the Imperial Reformation. Thus the Exertus Imperialis, as it had been for centuries, stopped existing. The link between the Imperial fleet and army was formally and bureaucratically severed. Never again would Imperial ground officers be given direct command over interstellar ships or even their own unit's air support. From the ashes of the Imperial Army were born the separate armed services of the Imperial Navy and the Imperial Guard. The Imperial Guard was reorganized into smaller units known as regiments, an existing formation from the old organization structure of the Imperial Army, and centrally trained political officers known as commissars were introduced to watch out for disloyalty. The interdependence of the newly formed Imperial Guard, the most numerous of the Emperor's armies, ensured that should a regiment turn against their oaths of loyalty, they would not be able to spread their treachery beyond a single world. And should an Imperial Navy fleet mutiny, they would not have the ability to resupply or deploy ground forces. The Imperium had learned a harsh and painful lesson following the dark days of the Horus Heresy. This was the birth of the Imperial Navy as it exists in the 41st millennium. Divided by logistics and separated by the gulfs of space and thousands of planetary cultures, it remains united by a common duty to mankind and the God Emperor. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the history of the Imperial Navy for today. If you have any questions or thoughts, always feel free to leave them in the comments below. As usual, if you enjoyed the video, please click the like button and maybe subscribe for future content. And if you want to help out my channel, please check my Patreon page. The link is in the video description. I thank you very much for watching and wish you a great day. The Emperor Protects.